Hello? Okay, we're good. Uh, if I start screaming, he's going to turn me down. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is James Mann. I'm the owner of Spicebush Woodcraft and Foraging. Um, I'm a naturalist, a forager, and a chef, um, and an educator. So um, what I do in my business is I take people out into the forest um, to have a visceral experience with nature, to... Um, you know, I kind of bait them out there with the wild food and the mushrooms and everything, but when we get out there, I can kind of switch it up. And we do find the mushrooms, but I get to give my um, spiel on ecology and what I think our role is in nature and how we can take back that role because I feel like that in order to truly appreciate and save what's going on out in the forests, that in the meadows and the marshes and the fens and all these different environments, that we actually have to be interacting with the environment. And, um, you know, we went from deforesting everything to not touching anything. And I think that neither one of those is the right thing. I think there's a middle ground to where um, when I talk about stewardship, I'm talking about interacting with the landscape. We're getting something from nature and we're giving back more than we um, take from nature. So that's a little bit about what I do um, in my business. After classes, I usually uh, make a wild food lunch for people. Like I said, I was a chef for a long time. Um, and I also provide resources and teach them how to preserve and to cook these different things because I want to bring it all full circle for people. Um, so before I get to talk about treasure, which is what we're all here for, um, I want to tell you how I got to this place. I grew up in southern Ohio um, at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, and um, I grew up foraging and um, fishing and all the kinds of things that you would do in like a small rural town. Um, I come from a kind of broken family a little bit. My parents were divorced. Um, my grandparents were all divorced and remarried, so I had a bunch of people um, around me, um, and I had an eclectic group of grandfathers. Um, <laughs> One of them is a dentist and a carpenter, and so I also do woodworking, and so I, I got inspired from that from them, from him, and he's probably one of the smartest men I've ever met. Um, one of my grandfathers was a pretty strict disciplinarian, but he was also very well liked in the community, and it, still today is probably the man I looked up to the most in my life. Um, and then my final one was a uh, recluse, but also loved foraging and so we would go out in the spring and look for morels and look for um, sassafras root and all these different things and I can remember having a huge table just full of morels with usually the biggest one right in the middle um, and we would just my grandma would fry them up and we would just like literally eat them as she was frying them up so um, it was really great growing up with that but um, when I graduated high school you know the opioid epidemic was hitting our place pretty hard I knew I had to get out and experience something else in the world so I went to OU to try and be a mechanical engineer and quickly realized that I was um, poor and was going to end up probably being um, worse off when I got out of there than I was. So I needed something a little bit quicker than that. So I went to culinary school. I'd always loved to cook and, um, you know, worked my way up from a dishwasher all the way up to fine dining restaurants in New Albany, New Albany Country Club, all these different types of restaurants around Columbus. Um, but all, what I really wanted was I wanted to be a Michelin star chef. I wanted to live that life. I wanted to work with weird and interesting ingredients that I got from the forest and the garden myself. And so I applied to intern at Favakin in Sweden, and I worked there in northern Sweden um, and got to experience um, some pretty incredible um, food and some amazing people. Um, they foraged and farmed every single thing on their menu, um, and it was probably the only restaurant I've ever worked in that could actually be considered a truly sustainable restaurant. I mean, they had 47 recycling bins that were all for one separate thing, you know. So something that unfortunately our restaurants here um, all around the country just cannot achieve with the way we are set up. But um, when I was there, I realized that, um, and it took me, uh, you know, a trip around the world to realize that maybe being a chef and the lifestyle that came along with that was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So when I came back to Columbus, I kind of switched gears and I've always loved gardening, and so I was applying at different farms. I was doing stuff on my own rental property, um, which uh, was probably more than anybody ever has done on a rental property before. Uh, I built a greenhouse out of old doors and windows, um, and that was what kind of got me hired at this mushroom farm. You know, the boss there, who was my mentor for many years, 
he um, was not going to hire me until he, I kept sending him stuff that I was doing. And he finally, my perseverance paid off. And he's like, okay, you obviously are going to do this regardless of you work here or not. So let's try to bring you on. So for four years, I grew mushrooms, um, microgreens, ginger, turmeric, the most weird and wild things possible. Um, and then during the pandemic, all that kind of shut down. So we knew people still needed fresh food. So what we did was we set up a table out in the parking lot with our mushrooms and we had thousands of seedlings growing for people's gardens and they don't stop growing because of the pandemic. So we needed to get rid of them somehow. So ended up after a couple years, we started the Beechwold Farm Market, which is still in operation today. Um, and w basically it's a grocery store farmer's market mix where everything from local farms and is offered. Um, and so the whole while this is happening, I'm out in the woods and every mo spare moment I have finding treasure, finding these mushrooms. I brought some things from the forest because typically I take people out into the forest and I can kind of hide behind the forest and so people don't listen to me as much and they can kind of just be inspired by the things around them. Um, so today, the treasure that I seek may look a little bit different than others. This is the treasure that I love and this is wild food. So um, many people don't know how much biodiversity we have here in Ohio. Um, in this region that we live in, um, people like to think of Ohio as the hell is real sign or um, <laughs> fields of corn and things like that. But in reality, um, the northern half of Ohio where the glacier had come down is all flat, but you get below that and it turns into this paradise. And I truly believe that Ohio is a paradise. Um, and you can just see there is just a huge diversity of mushrooms. And what I'll do is I'll pass around some of these mushrooms right now. And feel free to look, touch, smell. Um, there's lob there's mushrooms in there that um, resemble lobsters. Um, and they taste like lobster. Um, they're actually called lobster mushrooms. And you're going to find out that most mushroom names um, are pretty uh, not creative. So uh, <laughs> if, it, if it tastes like chicken, it's called chicken of the woods. If it looks like a hen, it tastes, it's called hen of the woods. Like, Every, you know, duck of the woods, everything is something of the woods. Um, but um, the cool thing is, is there's so many different types of mushrooms out there. There's chanterelles, which are little golden funnels that come out of the ground. There are mushrooms out there that literally have the texture of chicken breast. There are mushrooms with teeth, mushrooms with gills. Um, there are mushrooms that will make you see other dimensions. There'll, there are <laughs> mushrooms. There, there are mushrooms that can heal your sickness. There are mushrooms that can... Um, been shown to stop or reverse symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So mushrooms play such an important role in the environment. And if I start talking about the roles they play, we'll be here for three hours. So what I want to talk about is how I find treasure. And the first step to me finding treasure is curiosity. And um, basically what I'm going to be, the steps I'm going to be talking about today is essentially a boiled down version of the scientific method. And from going into the woods for many, many years and experiencing and learning and being curious about stuff, I have realized that um, we can determine a lot of things and we can find the treasure in our lives, the tangible and intangible treasures, by following a lot of these steps that I'm going to talk about today. And to, to even find the treasure, we have to know what questions to ask. We have to know what we're looking for in the first place, which is why my first step is curiosity. And being curious about what's going on around you um, is how you even determine what to find or what to ask to, in order to find it. So, um, you know, for me, the curiosity was uh, finding new ingredients, trying to find something else to work with. I, I have a bit of ADD. <laughs> I don't, not diagnosed, but I can just, you know, you can see it. Um, <laughs> I'm collecting, I'm collecting uh, bird's nests over here, so. Uh, <laughs> and chunks of wood. Um, but uh, so it started for me by finding these mushrooms, finding, the, finding out about these plants. Uh, this was before the internet. Foraging has kind of exploded on social media and things if you're in that niche algorithm. Um, and there are so many people out there identifying this stuff, telling you all about it. But when I started, the internet was not as good as it is now. And a lot of these um, websites I was going to were built by people that should never build a website. So it was a lot of... Um, searching, researching, taking mushrooms home, throwing them away, throwing them outside because I was too scared to try because it looked a little bit like something, but it also looked a little bit like something else. But I can say with confidence now that um, 
in addition to all the resources I've used and the time I've spent out in the woods, I've been able to identify a lot of different things. And I haven't made anybody sick yet, or at least they haven't told me they've gotten sick. So uh, either way, I'm still um, winning. Um, so we start with the first step of curiosity, you know, getting out there, um, finding out what you're curious about, what inspires you. And that's why I take people out into nature, because I want nature to inspire them. I want to, I'm not selling um, information, I'm selling an experience for people. Um, and the information just comes along with it, um, because I am just so passionate about this. And the more people, you know, one thing I often talk about is the succession of forests. And after I learned about how forests work and go from bare ground to a fully mature forest, it really started to make sense in my head that um, there's something bigger going on and that nature always knows what it's doing. And our job as humans is to be the caretakers of the forest. You know, our job and our roles has always been to take care of the, the forest, take care of, use the wood for building materials and firewood and these things. Use the things that nature creates so abundantly um, around us to be able to serve ourselves, but also in an act of reciprocity, give more back than we're taking. Um, so after curiosity, that's going to lead you to knowledge. And the knowledge would be, hey, okay, so I'm curious about these mushrooms. I'm trying to identify them and find out where they grow, when they grow, all these different things. So you start to learn a bunch of facts about nature. You start to learn about a bunch of facts about, um, say, an oak tree. You know, some years it's very abundant. Some years it's not. What is that? What's going on? Um, and so when we talk about knowledge, what I mean by that is just learning those facts and um, starting to realize what you're finding, what you're doing. And once you start learning these facts, you're not done. And I feel like a lot of people now stop at knowledge because everything, there's so much information, sometimes too much information out there that we stop at the knowledge part. We think because we've watched seven or eight 90 second videos about something that we're an expert in it now all of a sudden. And what I think is um, a huge detriment to ourselves is thinking that because we know things about things that we are um, somehow more knowledgeable than other people about it. Because what I feel like knowledge leads to is these pictures. Um, so these are just some pictures from my classes. But um, knowledge leads to understanding. Um, and so when I talk about understanding, I'm talking about experience, and I'm talking about um, it's great to have these facts, but as we go about it and as we go along, when I first started going foraging, I was basically just running through the brush, crawling under bushes, covered in ticks, covered in poison ivy, because I was just looking for mushrooms. And I just figured you go into the woods and you find them. And they're, they're around, you just have to look really hard for them. And a lot of people think that you have to um, go deep within the woods to find these things. Um, but as the years went by and as I would find more spots, I started to notice patterns of what was going on. Um, you know, certain mushrooms would be associated with certain areas, certain environments, certain trees. Um, they would come up at different times of the year. You start to learn how weather patterns affect how different things are going on. And, um, you know, maybe it's a bad year this year. How can I tell if it's going to be a bad year so I don't waste my time, you know, obsessively looking for these things every single day. Um, so, and that's what leads to the understanding is you start to see patterns that go on in nature year after year. You start to gain that experience and then you start to truly understand what's going on because what I find is that, and I'm sure if anyone here has a hobby or anything like that, you know that you watch a video of somebody say, I like to carve spoons and I like to make things out of wood. So you watch a video of someone carving a spoon, and you're like, that doesn't look that bad. I'll get the tools, I'll get the wood, blah, blah, blah. And then you start to do it, and you're like, wow, this is not turning out. This, for one, it's taking 24 hours when it took them three. And number two, this does not look like a spoon. Um, <laughs> but you start to realize, um, you start to unfold the layers within that, and you start to um, understand how the grain of wood works, um, what type of wood you want to use, what the age of the wood, the tools you need, how to sharpen your tools, all these different things start to, and then within that, there are folds within that. What's the best way to sharpen the tool? What's the best thing to use? Um, how do I know it's sharp? How do I know this wood is good? So it's, you keep diving down and um, revealing more and more about these things, and that's where I feel like the understanding um, comes into play. And so um, 
What I think is that curiosity leads to knowledge, knowledge leads to understanding, and that's how we find the treasure. And that's how I'm able to find all these different things because it's not just mushrooms, elderflowers. This is just not an edible plant. It's actually a toxic plant, but it's called a green dragon and it's very beautiful. And I just wanted to find it just to find it. Um, and I did, and that's what I found that like the more curious I am about things and the more, um, once I started applying this technique and say, okay, I'm curious about this plant that I've seen someone post about, and I really want to find that. So you start learning a little bit about it and about its environment. Then you go out and you apply that knowledge and, you, and your understanding of these environments. And then you can find um, anything you want, really, because it's all out there. And same with the black raspberries. They're everywhere. Here's some more pictures from the classes. And so now that I have the understanding, I can find things like this. I can find these giant flushes of mushrooms um, and be able to take them home and also use them for us. We, this is my girlfriend, Sarah, right here. Um, we love them and we eat them all year round, which is why I like to aggressively harvest them wherever I can. And um, we preserve them. And I also use them in my classes um, to show people how um, to use this treasure and to utilize it and to be able to take it home and show them that this is real food and that it's not some novel experience. You know, the thing is, is I think that people, and not to say that this food is going to um, completely change your diet and you're, don't, you're never going to have to go to the grocery store again. Um, no, but I think after the pandemic, we've all learned that uh, we can't be completely reliant on any one thing. We need to be diverse in our diet. And the funny thing is, is people say things like eat the rainbow, but what people don't realize is that most of the plants that we eat and vegetables we eat are from three or four different families of plants. So essentially, they are all the same plant, but we've hybridized and, and selectively picked over the years to change these different morphologies of them. But um, all the mushrooms you buy in the grocery store, portobello, cremini, white button, they're all the exact same mushroom grown in different ways. Um, whereas with this, there's an incredible variety of different mushrooms. Um, same thing with plants, eating milkweed, eating different weeds from all different sorts of families. Um, the fact that things grown out in nature are so much more mineral rich and so much more nutrient dense. Um, I will die on the hill of acorns because I do believe that acorns were once and can be again a staple food in our diet that is number one, abundant. Number two, we have to do zero work for that except for the labor of processing. Um, but the trees grow it all on their own. Um, so just trying to get people more in that mindset of, um, hey, like, let's diversify our diet. Let's get some things from nature. Let's grow some things. And yes, I'm never going to be making my own soy sauce in my basement. I shouldn't say that because we might. But uh, <laughs> I just don't have the time to right now. But uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but for most people, they're not going to be making their own fish sauce or their own soy sauce. So there's always going to be things that we need to get from the store and, and rely on others for, um, which is why I think also that um, what we tend to forget sometimes is that food has always been the center of community. And, um, you know, people, indigenous people in this area, the Shawnee, Wyandotte, Delaware, all these different um, indigenous communities around here, they weren't acting alone. They weren't going out and harvesting acorns and processing them just for them, their family. This was, these were community events. These were community things where everyone would come out for this common cause of like, we are making the food for our community for the winter and these things like that. So um, I think getting back into that mindset of like, hey, you know, the problem I have with homesteading and um, things like that right now is it's all about self-sufficiency. Well, self-sufficiency is, I'm sorry, not attainable. It's not attainable. We, my um, girlfriend and I, we steward a acre of land in South Columbus and we do a lot of stuff but there is no way that we can do everything. The amount of labor it takes just to have a garden and chickens and ducks is you know, about the precipice of overwhelming. To imagine having uh, pigs and a cow or all these different things is just um, not attainable. So what we do is we support local farms that do these things the right way and that we trust. And we also get our food from the forest and we also get our food from the grocery store. And all these things adding up, um, at the end of the day, are going to successfully fill that need that we have um, to have all this diverse, nutrient-dense food that is not reliant completely on the grocery store. So what I like to tell my classes um, is 
Here's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to find an area that's access a natural area that's accessible to you, and I want you to go there and I want you to walk. Find a find a trail that you like. Find an area that you like um, that you can go to maybe once a week, maybe multiple times a week if you have the time. But go there often. Go through throughout the seasons, even in the winter time. Go there, and the more you go and the more you um, pay attention and observe, the more things you're going to start to see. You know, an interesting thing I like to tell people is that. Um, you know, people are something, they are affected by something called mushroom blindness. And I guarantee you, if you walked out into the woods right now, you would walk past 20 to 30 species of mushrooms and you would not even see them. No matter how hard you looked, honestly, because we've been conditioned over years and years and years to um, be scared of nature. I've heard people say um, to their kids, hands to your sides, everything is poison ivy. And that's an extreme example, obviously, but the thing with that is, is that, um, you know, it sets this basis of nature equals fear. And what I feel like is that we need to respect nature and you can respect things like poison ivy because even though something like poison ivy is not um, beneficial and actually harms us, um, it is incredibly beneficial to the wildlife in our communities. Um, and the berries, the shade that it provides, all these different things, like we're the only thing that's allergic to poison ivy. So to, to, and that doesn't mean that you should just let it go run rampant on your house and all that stuff, but it's about respect. It's about respecting these things instead of fearing them. Another thing I talk about a lot in my classes is um, invasive species, um, and that's invasive species of plants, invasive species of insects and animals. And while plants are not inherently bad just because they're from somewhere else, they're filling a role in the environment that our native plants need to be filling because they have co-evolved with all of the other species around to work together. Um, and so this is something I elaborate much more in the classes, um, but just so I don't get too off, off topic, the, the one analogy I'd like to leave you guys with, and what, what I like to use, um, is that I feel that um, in addition to going out to these places over and over again, I feel that we need to start regarding um, these plants and fungi and trees and insects and everything as communities, as friends, um, because they are. Just because they can't communicate with us, just because they don't look like us, does not mean that there's not something deeper going on that we don't understand. And I feel like when we change the language and we say, hey, um, these are communities of things that are happening. When I see a, a big group of something, I call it a community. You know, because it is. You know, these, th these plants have friends, foes, enemies, children, parents. They have all these things that we have. They just cannot speak or have eyes or you know all these different things that make us human but that does not mean that they're no less sentient than we are um, and they've shown us that you know when our ecosystems are not healthy we are not healthy mentally spiritually physically and when you um, improve these ecosystems riparian areas um, upper um, edgeland ecosystems all these different ecosystems when we repair those we will be healthier as a result because it's a cascading effect from the microbiology in the soil all the way up to us, all the way to the air, to the, the water. Everything is healthier when we are healthy. So um, the analogy I like to use is that um, if you had a neighbor, an old, maybe an old lady, we have an old lady that lives beside us, and um, you didn't know her, you never really cared to talk to her, uh, maybe she's a little bit mean like our neighbor is. <laughs> Um, maybe she's a crotchety old woman, and, but that is a, but it, and say you don't know her, um, and maybe she dies, and she doesn't have any family, but if you don't know her and you don't really care about her because you don't know her, you wouldn't even know, notice she was gone, and maybe she's there for two months dead, and you would never even know. <laughs> We're taking a dark turn, guys. <laughs> but here's the lie at the end of the tunnel. When you engage in your community and you start, and you, start um, you know, even simple niceties as just trying to come over and say, hi, how you doing? Um, all these different things, just, just talking to somebody, getting to know your neighbors, um, and something does happen, then you can be responsive to that. And you can say, I haven't seen so-and-so in a couple of days. I wonder if something's wrong. Maybe we should go check on that. I feel the same way about our, our plant communities. You know, if we are disengaged, and we are never um, trying to get to know or understand these things, then all the people that say that they love nature are kind of doing it arbitrarily. 
that, okay, I love nature as this big thing, but if you don't ever get to know them, how can you truly know what's going on if they're healthy, if they're not healthy? Um, and so that's why I bring people out into the woods, and that's why I brought the woods in here. Because um, I want to show you guys how beautiful nature is and how abundant it can be. Um, and not only that, but how much it has to offer us and what we can offer it in return. And I feel like getting people back out in the landscape, doing the things that humans do, um, is only going to just benefit us. Because while back to the land movements have not worked in the past, we have this unique opportunity here of this free spread of information where we can learn from each other so quickly. And that we have modern technology to be able to um, aid us so that we can go back to the land without having to suffer and to, you know, not have potable water and you know, we, don't, we shouldn't have to suffer. We should be able to mix and utilize the technology and the breakthroughs that we've made and also be able to live out on the land. I feel like um, through convenience, we've gone completely the other way. Con technology and convenience were only supposed to help us to live a better life. But now we're using it as a crutch. And I think that is a um, disservice to ourselves um, as humans because we belong on the landscape and we've co-evolved with nature just like everything else. And so the longer that we can, um, the, the, and I'm going over time here, but uh, the more we can connect with nature is all I'm trying to say. The more we can connect with nature and the more we can get back on the landscape, even in simple ways of just going out and hunting mushrooms, picking blackberries, picking black raspberries, doing these things, making real food out of them, creating those traditions again for our families is how we're all going to be healthier and um, create a more sustainable life. So thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it.